It makes sense politically, rationally, electorally, to gain political power by saying all sorts of terrible things about immigrant groups, and then you're in power. But at a certain point, the math doesn't work out. What is the classic gangster film Scarface, the Dublin musical romance Once, and the French coming-of-age film Samia have in common? They're all stories of human beings coping with their transition to a new home country in very different ways, and their situations are all representative stories of the case studies at the center of Joel Fetzer's new book, Open Borders and International Migration Policy. Fetzer, a professor of political science at Pepperdine University, examines three cases of massive and at times nearly unrestricted immigration made famous in the movie. The influx of Central European immigrants to Ireland in the early 2000s as portrayed in the film Once. The flood of Algerians into Marseille in the wake of the Algerian War as seen in the French film Samia. I always know one day I'm coming here, United States. And the Cubans who ended up in South Florida after Castro's purging of the so-called scum of Cuban society, some results of which are memorably portrayed in Scarface. Fetzer sat down with us to discuss what these three natural experiments in mass migration tell us about the arguments for and against opening our borders. Now, open borders itself is kind of a politically contentious term. What does that term mean to you? Basically, uh, getting rid of uh, not necessarily inspection, but restrictions on migration. So all the blocking would have to do with safety concerns and disease screenings rather than some sort of quota based on which country they're coming from. Right. So, I mean, I think an open borders policy would uh, get rid of the idea of restricting people because we don't like your culture or your religion or the color of your skin or your skill level or something like that. And talk about some of the common arguments. Immigrants take local jobs and they drive down wages. Uh, did you find that to be true when you looked at these examples? In these three cases, I actually didn't uh, find those effects in general. So across the board, there were no significant drops in uh, wages and there were no significant increases in the unemployment rate for natives. Partly, this book is a replication across different countries and across different types of kind of social and economic phenomena of a classic study that David Card did. Um, and he found that in the Mario case, which in some ways is sort of the most extreme case, you have almost 100,000 people coming overnight. The labor force increases almost overnight by 7%. What he found was really there was no effect on wages and the labor market. So it suggests that really the labor market concerns are, are not well-founded at all, at least in these, these three cases that I studied. So another argument is that immigrants are a drain on public resources. They use the welfare system, they crowd the schools. Is there any merit to that argument that they're a drain on public services? I found here that at least after you control for sort of uh, intergovernmental transfers, so especially from the national level down to the, the local level, uh, you don't really have negative uh, financial effects. In some cases, there are even positive effects, especially in Dublin, after the Eastern Europeans, especially Polish migrants, A8 migrants came, the tax coffers seemed to increase, and so they had a larger budget surplus. One negative effect that you did find in the Miami case was a slight boost in the homicide mm -hmm. rate, mm -hmm. and I believe you found some other boosts in burglaries in some of the other cases. We do have comparable statistics for all three of the cities, and statistically significant there was an increase in the burglary rate. Now, that's the burglary rate. What we don't know is exactly who the burglars were and who the victims were. So, certainly in the Marseille case, we have anecdotal evidence that the victims were the immigrants themselves, and it was the natives who were burglarizing the migrants. So, that's not exactly what a lot of anti-immigrant uh, politicians think of when they say that you know, it's going to cause a crime problem. There was a very significant increase in the homicide rate in Miami only. So I think what was going on in the Miami case was that Castro actually did, uh, in certain cases, go and uh, try to get rid of what he viewed as undesirables from his society. So in a famous speech and, and some editorials in Granma, he calls them escoria, right, or scums, gusano, uh, kind of worms. There were cases, certainly, that he let them directly out of the jails, forced them into the boats, forced the families, the Cuban families, from. Uh, from Miami to take them along with their family members. Uh, and then once they got into uh, Miami, they did um, you know, bad things. Donald Trump has explicitly drawn a connection between 
immigration that's coming from our southern border, from Mexico and Central American countries, to that Mariel boat lift. Are we facing a Scarface type situation um, on our southern border right now? Donald Trump is not the best statistician in the world, I would argue. And uh, if you look at the recent statistics, basically since the Great Recession, you haven't had net migration from Mexico into the United States. Certainly there are Mexicans who come, but there have been more Mexicans who were leaving or deciding to stay at home for demographic and economic reasons. What is causing a lot of migration now is uh, Central America, and that's uh, places like Honduras, where um, the state is having very difficult times competing with uh, other sort of violent organizations, especially drug cartels in that country. And so that's causing unbearable violence, including for children, say a 12 or 13 year old who's being forced um, out of his or her neighborhood in Tegucigalpa because of the violence. Um, that's not the same person as kind of a 25 year old who's already from you know, Havana who's already done two or three hits, right? Mm -hmm. A very different type of person. So and overall, if you look at the most uh, rigorous quantitative studies, they don't find overall that immigration causes an increase in the crime rate. There's tension in certain European countries because of, for instance, a lot of Muslim immigration and they feel like their cities are becoming something that they weren't before. Is that a legitimate fear and is, is it something that's, that's happened before? I found using a lot of public survey data from the U.S. and from Europe that uh, people's attitudes are rooted just as much in sort of cultural fear or, or the fear that their culture is going to be um, kind of unrespected or kind of disassociated with the government. It's not going to be seen as prestigious uh, as compared to some of the immigrant cultures, right? And this goes back like in the United States all the way, you know, to Jefferson's time, right? So the, um, you know, the people who voted for Jefferson, some of them were Scotch-Irish or in the late 1800s you have lots of, you know, beer drinking German Catholics or Irish Catholics and they're seen as a big threat to the Protestants and English and so on who were here before. So if it's these deeply rooted cultural anxieties as you say that stretch all the way back to almost the beginning of the Republic, is there any hope for a political turn back towards uh, liberalization of immigration, let alone open borders? What tends to happen is that the height of xenophobia, at least against a particular group, say the Chinese in the 1880s in, in California, the West Coast and so on, politically disempowered at that point. It makes sense politically, rationally, electorally to gain political power by saying all sorts of terrible things about immigrant groups um, and then you're in power. But that, uh, at a certain point, the math doesn't work out. Look at what happened to Pete Wilson in this state, right? Pete Wilson in the early 1990s arguably scapegoated uh, Latino immigrants, people coming from especially Mexico. He was able to get those largely Anglo votes, non-Latino votes in California, and he was put back into the governor's office in Sacramento. But in the long run, arguably destroyed the Republican Party in the state. And so what happens is that you get this wave of xenophobia that gets to the point where um, targets a group, and then that group eventually gain uh, political power. So I think in the long run, yes, uh, I think you know, as the U.S.'s immigrant streams become more and more diverse and we have more and more uh, groups in the United States who are first, second, third generation immigrants, they will become much more uh, pro-immigrant, politically empowered, and that will lead politicians in the long run at least to, uh, to stop scapegoating them. Joel Fetzer, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, it's been a pleasure. For Reason TV, I'm Zach Weissmuller.